Okay, so we are ready to go. So good afternoon, everybody. So it has been quite good for the whole day, but now we have an amazing talk on dark matter. So we have a morning talk, the first lecture on dark matter by Vasudev from TIFR. And now we'll have uh, Professor Neil Weiner uh, giving our his first talk. It's the second talk on dark matter. So Neil is a professor uh, at NYU, New York University, and uh, Neil has done uh, uh, a quite a bit of uh, contribution to the field of dark matter, dark matter search, and possible interactions. And he has pioneered many papers. So, and he's an amazing speaker. And I happen to be his first PhD student also. So it's a great moment that in India, Neil is speaking. So, and it's not easy to give a talk from 6 a.m. from Manhattan. It's dark. I can feel it, though the background doesn't look like. So welcome, Neil, and we are excited about it. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, uh, it's, a, it's a pleasure to, to be here, if, if not actually there. Um, uh, I do hope to get the chance to be there in person at some point when it's, when it's appropriate. Uh, let me also take just a moment uh, to, to comment that it's especially appropriate. Um, for uh, me to be giving this talk, as you probably everybody knows, uh, we've just elected our first uh, Indian American vice president in this country. And you know, we in many of the places in the United States are celebrating this fact broadly, but I think it's a, a great um, comment on the uh, tremendous things that have come out of the relationship between India and the United States. And I'm excited to see all the things that are going to come out of that relationship and I hope to uh, have hopefully some of the people who are in this talk right now are uh, part of the relationship that I'll get to participate with in the future. So um, uh, I want to talk today, uh, I'm going to be talking about models and signals of dark matter, uh, as it says here in the title. Um, uh, since I'm giving two lectures, I'm going to um, I split them up as I'll describe in the outline. Um, from a pedagogical purpose, I'm going to treat this one as sort of a, a blackboard lecture uh, that tends to slow me down a bit and I think makes things a little bit clearer. But I also would hope that you would feel free to interject and ask any questions at any time that you'd like to know about. Tomorrow, um, so this is just the rough outline. Today is going to be very blackboardy. Tomorrow, I'm going to have more slides. Uh, I'll have more data and presentations. It'll be more of a standard talk. Uh, and hopefully between the two of them, we'll, we'll actually learn something. So today, I'm going to start with a glossary of dark matter. I just think it's a, a worthwhile thing as we're talking about these different models to sort of introduce some of the basic uh, models and terms that people talk about, even if they're not going to be ones that we're going to be uh, discussing quite actively at this workshop. Uh, and that's also an opportunity for you to just throw out and ask if there are any other ones that you'd like to know about. Uh, you already heard this morning um, about um, uh, thermal relics. Uh, so I'm gonna uh, pick up from that and I'm gonna talk about thermal relics and their signals. Um, uh, I'll take a quick derivation uh, through, um, through that, although you've already gotten uh, derivation from the person who knows it best this morning. I'll follow that with a discussion of sort of the canonical WIMP. What is the sort of like baseline dark matter model that you can consider? You build a lot of intuition out of it. Understanding it helps you understand a lot of the other problems. We'll talk about the direct and indirect detection signals that we see from it. And then after that, hopefully, I will have time to talk about uh, models of portals into the dark sector. Tomorrow, then we'll move on to anomalies and models that can describe those anomalies. And as I said before, uh, don't hesitate to uh, uh, interject with any uh, questions. So let's begin. So like I said, I actually have all these things. I have all these things on my notes, but I'm going to write them out uh, just so that I don't go too fast. Um, uh, if I am going too fast, please let me know and I will slow down. So let's begin by discussing models of dark matter. So if you're thinking about models of dark matter, there are a few questions that you should focus on. The first question, of course, if you're thinking about a model of dark matter is this question of what is it? 
You want to understand what the model of dark matter is at a basic field theory level. And that's because, of course, that's what defines all of its interactions and properties. But also because very often you'll find that people will have different names to talk about what is effectively, in the effective field theory, the same basic model of dark matter. So when we talk about what is it, you always want to say, what is it from the effective field theory point of view? What are the fundamental interactions? What are the fundamental uh, charges and symmetries that this theory has that dictate to it what it is? The second thing is that you want to consider when thinking about a dark matter model, and you should ask all these questions whenever you hear a model of a dark matter, what motivates it? Why are we talking about this model? Is it a model of dark matter that is connected to some solution to some broader problem? Is it just some scenario that we can write down and we want to explore parameter space? Uh, is it something that we have a hint of possibly from some sort of anomaly? Uh, you want to understand what the motivation is. Um, not that that's definitive, but just because it's always good to keep in mind you know, how much you should be willing to bend over backwards uh, to, to do some of the gymnastics you sometimes have to do to keep these models. The next is a critical question. Why is it stable? If you want dark matter to be around today, obviously it has to be stable and you wanna understand the reason for it. The signatures of that dark matter model are often inextricably tied to the thing that makes it stable because a quantum number, a parity uh, can connect it to other possible observables in, in your scenario. Another important question is, is it dead? A lot of models you might have heard about might now be dead, or they might be half dead. But a dead model is not necessarily a bad thing. Uh, dead models uh, help motivate new models um, and, uh, and uh, provide us a, a jumping off point for new things to consider. Um, so those are sort of the four basic questions uh, um, that you want to start with. And then of course, there are the implications and, and signals of the model, but these are the basic things when you're starting out asking about a model, you wanna understand what it's the effective field theory for it, why are we talking about it? Why is it around today? And is it something which is still actively alive? So going from there, I wanna discuss a glossary of dark matter. So there are a lot of different models of dark matter that people throw around. And if you're an expert on them, eventually you come to sort of like uh, know them, but uh, it takes a while and it's not always obvious what these models are that people are talking about. So let me take a quick, quick moment to just go through some of the models and answer these questions about them. Now there's two models that of course I would ordinarily want to start off with, the axion and primordial black holes. But since you have, a number of lectures on those. I don't feel any need to actually go into a discussion about what an axion is or what primordial black holes are and why you should think about them. So let me go on to the next uh, one to explain, and that is the WIMP. So what is the WIMP? The WIMP is a weakly interacting massive particle. Now, when people talk about weak, there's a lot of different ways that people can mean that. So weak can mean weak with a capital W, which is to say that this is a particle that has weak interactions. So interacts with W bosons, Z bosons, and thus has direct interactions with the standard model through that. It can also have lowercase weak interactions, which is it can have interactions which are characterized by the weak scale. So even though the, the scale that is setting all the interactions of this particle might be the uh, weak scale, it may not actually directly talk to the W boson or Z boson. And finally, there is weak in quotes, where really this has nothing to do with the weak scale or weak interactions at all. And you simply mean that it carries some sort of like uh, similar phenomenology to what we think of as sort of historical WIMPs. And that is that you're just talking about something which is a thermal relic. And we'll get back to that in a little bit. And I wanna emphasize this because if somebody talks about a WIMP, you really don't actually know what they're talking about. That's not enough information. 
Some people, when they talk about WIMP, will really truly mean particles that have weak interactions connect to the standard model. Some people will be talking about par particles that have interactions which are characterized by the weak scale. And other people will simply mean, when they talk about a WIMP, is that they simply mean a thermal relic, something which is left over after being in equilibrium in the early universe. And that's worth being clear when people are talking about it. So that's model one. Next point in our glossary. This is not an alphabetical order, obviously, nor should it be. The next win, the next scenario, consider, is the neutralino. So what is the neutralino? Well, in supersymmetry, or SUSY, you promote all of the particles of the standard model to have superpartners. So you take all the bosons, say the hypercharged gauge boson, the neutral uh, component of the W bosons, the neutral components of the Higgs bosons, and you promote them to new fields by the inclusion of a tilde. So you've got the Bino, the Wino, and Higgsinos. And you can take, and in principle, <clears throat> All these particles here can be stable and you can have a linear combination of them. So some coefficient matrix where you have some linear combination of uh, Wino, Higgsino, and Bino. And the lightest of these linear combinations, you'll have four mass eigenstates, and the lightest of these linear combinations are um, is a dark matter candidate. So what is it? It's that. It's the superpartner, some linear combination of the superpartners of the neutral fields in the standard model, plus one extra Higgs boson. It's motivated by the hierarchy problem that we'll discuss later, and it's tested by WIMP states searches. It's still alive, and it used to be by far the most popular candidate, although at the moment, it is, it is less so as people have explored its phenomenology. It's not unpopular, it's not less popular for any concrete reason, except for that much of the phenomenology has been worked out and there are a lot of new things to do in other areas. The other scenario that you might consider in, uh, in SUSY models is this neutrino. So that you again, promote a field to a super field by adding a tilde. You take the neutrino and you turn it into the scalar neutrino. Again, it's motivated by the hierarchy problem. It's tested by WIMP searches. And the canonical neutrino, so if you just took the standard model neutrino and you turned it into a, a, a scalar uh, partner, that model is actually dead and long since dead uh, for reasons that we talked about. It has too large of interactions with the standard model and would have been uh, tested. There are tweaks you can do though uh, that allow it to uh, continue to live. So for instance, there is a mixed neutrino where you take this neutrino and you mix it with some other singlet scalar and that model can be uh, alive. Next is the sterile neutrino. So the sterile neutrino is a bit of a misnomer, if, um, many people have, have, have uh, uh, studied this, um, but the sterile neutrino is a bit of a misnomer in the sense that the sterile neutrino does not actually have anything to do with the neutrino a priori. It can, in extensions of the standard model, be connected to it in some sort of grand unified sense. But in reality, the sterile neutrino is just some singlet fermion. So some fermion that carries no standard model gauge charges and that that standard model fermion can have some sort of Dirac mass where it marries off against the standard model neutrino. Uh, that then allows it to mix with the standard model neutrino, pick up interactions with the standard model neutrino and, uh, and, and possibly be produced. Uh, in most iter formations where we try to understand the serial neutrino as dark matter, this is typically a particle who has a, a mass around a KeV and the motivation for the sterile neutrino is probably, uh, I would say it's motivated by minimality. If you really want to consider a model of dark matter, a model goes beyond the standard model that has the fewest possible additions to it, 
no new interactions, no new grand principles to the standard model, adding some new fermion is actually a quite minimal thing to do. And it's remarkable that by simply adding a singlet fermion to the standard model, you actually can get um, uh, a, par uh, a, a particle that can explain the relic abundance, as well as possibly in some scenarios, the baryon anti-baryon uh, anti asymmetry. Typically, this is done by adding some additional mass term for the right-handed neutrino as well. And you have some seesaw that allows the uh, mixing angle to be small. So this MN here is around a KeV, and this MD then provides some sort of mixing. It's pretty constrained though. It's not dead, but it's pretty constrained because if you have light, if you have light sterile neutrinos, then structure formation is a problem. And if you get up too heavy, then the sterile neutrinos will decay and you'll get X-ray limits. You'll get X-ray emission from galaxy clusters. So typically if you go, if you go too light, the particle is um, too relativistic. It's too warm. It erases too much small scale structure and thus would have been, uh, and thus is excluded by the fact that we see small structures, small galaxies. If it were too heavy, it would be decaying at a sufficiently high rate that we would see X-rays from galaxy clusters. So that leaves you a window in the sort of few KEV range uh, where this particle can still exist. And as is pointed out, there are some anomalies that we'll discuss tomorrow that possibly could get you very excited about this possibility. What about the LTOP? This is another model of dark matter. It's not really a model. LTOP is something called the lightest T odd particle. Oh, and I should say that for the sake of time, I'm not going to be scribbling in references right now. I'm going to add in uh, at the end of my talks all I'm a, a, um, a document with uh, references for the different uh, topics that you can go look up. Um, so uh, there's the lightest T odd particle. Uh, this was motivated uh, uh, some time ago in a way that I'll describe a, a, a little bit later, that if you have something called T-parity, uh, that can make models that solve the hierarchy problem uh, more robust against uh, some sorts of, of constraints that, we've, uh, that we have not seen yet. Uh, so this is not actually a specific model. It's simply a statement that you have a natural parity uh, that could be present in models beyond the standard model, T parity, which is a variant of R parity. Um, and it's often, this often shows up in, in little Higgs models. Um, as a possible dark matter candidate. Another model of dark matter is KK dark matter. This is Kaluza Klein dark matter. So um, people have not spent in recent years as much ener energy on extra dimension models, but it's still a, a, an exciting and an appealing model. So if you have an extra dimensional theory, so if you imagine that you have uh, additional dimensions of space uh, that are in some sense accessible to the effective field theory, then the fifth coordinate, the fifth direction, um, uh, when you look at momentum in that fifth coordinate, uh, that looks like a mass from a, a 4D perspective. Uh, you have a tower of particles with quantized momenta in the fifth dimension, which looks like a tower of particles uh, with uh, different masses. That's what's called the Kaluza Klein tower. And it can be that you can have the lightest Kaluza Klein particle be stable, uh, sort of a relic of the conservation momentum in, in the fifth dimension. And so if you imagine that say standard model particles, if you imagine standard model particles are actually embedded into higher dimensional theory, then you can think about the first excitation of either the hypercharge gauge boson or of the neutrino. Um, and these provide you with interesting dark matter candidates. Typically the constraints on these types of these, these kinds of models can look very much like WIMPs and they're a category of WIMP. 
in the sense that they're thermal relics. And they're usually constrained um, often not so much by searches on the dark matter as much as they are on constraints on the searches for dark matter. Another model to consider is the Axino. And while we're at it, I'll just also include the Gravitino. Uh, so you're hearing about the Axion. Well, in the standard model, or in, excuse me, in supersymmetry, if you take the, the Axion and you promote it into a superfield, then you have the imaginary part, which is your usual Axion. You have a real part, which is called the Saxion. And you have a uh, axino, uh, the superpartner fermion of the axion as well. And if the axion, if the sorry, if the uh, axino is the lightest superpartner, then it can be a dark matter candidate. Uh, typically, because there's a lot of parameter space available to you, it can be from KeV to GeV in mass, uh, and um, its dominant signals are usually through uh, decays. Likewise, in SUSY, you've got the graviton, which can is has a, a partner, which is the gravitino. Uh, and it also can be a dark matter candidate, although it's very, very tough to constrain um, in, in most scenarios. A nice sort of baseline model for considering um, models of dark matter is the inert doublet. This is just a scalar field that fills out a two one half representation of the standard model. So a singlet under color, a doublet under SU2 and hypercharge one half. So it has the same charges as uh, a Higgs boson or of a neutrino, um, but is um, a scalar field and absent any sort of um, uh, Higgs-like interactions to the standard model, it can be stable. So it can have a Z2 symmetry that keeps it stable. And it looks very much like a canonical WIMP. And it's going to look like a canonical WIMP in, in a way that I'll describe in, the, in, in a bit later. Next, let's consider asymmetric dark matter. Well, asymmetric dark matter had, as in its original idea, a very appealing scenario, which is that there is some sort of, if you ask, why are things stable? Well, if you have a thermal relic and you imagine that it can annihilate itself away, then it's present because it froze out and there simply didn't have an opportunity to get rid of itself entirely. But we know that there are particles with very strong interactions that uh, did not annihilate themselves away, namely baryons. And so we know that it's quite reasonable for particles to be stable, not simply because uh, they didn't, in, in present, not because they didn't annihilate themselves away, but because they carry some primordial number originating from somewhere. And so the idea was originally that you might have some dark matter number. And originally the thought was that this might be the same as baryon number, or at least the opposite of baryon number. So the idea was possibly we see a baryon number in the universe, and dark matter carries baryon number, but it carries the opposite number. So you've sort of sequestered, you've separated that dark matter, that, that quantum number into observable baryons and into uh, invisible dark matter. And that had a very appealing uh, idea because if the number densities of dark matter and baryons are the same, and if somehow dark matter and baryons have similar masses, then it would make a lot of sense that the energy density in dark matter would be comparable to the energy density in uh, baryons, thus solving sort of one of the strange coincidences of cosmology. Why do we have about the same amount of dark matter as we have baryons? Um, again, just like with WIMPs, where what you mean when you say WIMP can vary from person to person, so too can asymmetric dark matter vary from person to person. While this was sort of the original motivation uh, decades ago for considering asymmetric dark matter, it's morphed um, quite a bit to a point where now asymmetric dark matter simply means dark matter with a quantum number. So dark matter carries some dark matter number. And the fact that there is more 
dark matter, then anti-dark matter is what causes it to be stable. And in some scenarios, that dark matter number is connected to baron number or lepton number. In some cases, it's not. Uh, and at this point, asymmetric dark matter simply means this idea that you've got something which is stable uh, because of, of, of a quantum number. Next, we have portal models. And hopefully I'm gonna have time to talk a bit more about this because this is a very, very exciting uh, scenario. So portal models, and in particular, the vector portal model um, is a scenario where uh, you have different operators that allow you to connect to the standard model. So this is, for instance, where mixing between a dark photon and the standard model photon allows an interaction between a dark sector and the standard model and allows thermalization and interactions. And I, I intend to talk quite a bit about that. So I'm not going to spend too much time on it here. Then there is a term, uh, I'm not gonna go through all of these, but just as an example, there's something called forbidden dark matter. Forbidden dark matter, ordinarily, we've talked about situations where you have say dark matter annihilating into some uh, state Y. And the assumption is, is that the mass of that cumulative state Y should be less than the mass of the chi-chi pair, such that the dark matter can annihilate into it. But you certainly can have the possibility that the mass of Y is greater, but similar to the mass of the chi-chi pair. And thus the annihilation of dark matter into Y can only take place when you have some thermal energy as well. So you're relying on some thermal energy to kick you up into a high enough energy state that that state can then annihilate into dark matter. Or sorry, can annihilate into some uh, separate uh, final state, maybe in the standard model or not. And that changes quite a bit the phenomenology and the expectations uh, because you typically need much larger uh, uh, couplings to get that done. And I won't go through all of them, uh, but this forbidden dark matter is sort of a, uh, a variant on thermal models where it's clearly a thermal model, it's a thermal relic, but it takes you out of your uh, um, sort of traditional parameter space. And there are other models that do this as well. Um, and uh, we might discuss some of them depending on time. Let me pause for a second and see if there are any questions. Yeah, there is one question. Uh, yeah, you can. What is, what is uh, uh, what, what's inert about inert dark matter is that it does not have any direct couplings to standard model fermions. Oh, this is not a list of all possible dark matter candidates. Um, there are many, many, many uh, scenarios here I'm, that I'm not going to get into. Quark nuggets are certainly a, a possible uh, model. Uh, cue balls, elders, there are many, many, many models uh, and we can discuss them. This just kind of go through some of the models that people are talking about. Uh, and uh, we could certainly spend all day. I just wanted to start off with some of the scenarios that, that I think are pretty commonly talked about. So let me go on then to what I didn't want to say it. Sorry, that's my last one. So if you want to think of a model of dark matter, of course, you should start off with this question of why, how did it come to be, right? How dark matter comes to be is almost invariably one of the uh, critical questions that you need to answer and helps you, gives you a sense of what model space, what parameter space you live in and how you're gonna connect it to other things. And of course, it's very easy to, in a sort of like basic philosophical sense, break this down into two categories, which are thermal and non-thermal. So thermal dark matter is basically the statement that dark matter was in equilibrium in the early universe. And whatever it happens to be now is just a direct result of that, uh, 
of, of, of that initial situation. Non-thermal has a lot more variability in it. Um, you can imagine you start with thermal particles. So you produce some thermal particles. Those particles then decay out of equilibrium. You can have a phase transition. You can have topological defects, which are a result of a phase transition. Um, so there are a lot of different possibilities for non-thermal production as well. And then in between, for lack of a better word, there are what I'm gonna call thermal-ish production mechanisms. And that would be things like freeze-in, scenarios where you have contact and you are actually produced out of the thermal bath of the standard model, but you never actually reach thermal equilibrium. And it's important to kind of distinguish between these thermal and thermal-ish models because sometimes people will actually say, oh, thermal production of dark matter, and they don't actually mean that the dark matter is a thermal relic. They really mean that it is produced from the thermal bath of standard model particles. And so again, you just have to be very careful with the language uh, when talking about these things, uh, to be clear. So let's start by talking about thermal water models. So let's start with dark matter at the weak scale. So you all heard um, the story of a thermal freeze out from the person who knows it probably better than anybody else this morning. Uh, and let me give a little bit of a sort of background in terms of why this becomes especially interesting. So let's take a step back and think about the hierarchy problem. Like why do people care so much about weak scale particles? And the hierarchy problem is just this idea, as probably many of you know, that if the Higgs boson comes in and it goes through a top loop, that that top loop generates a correction to the Higgs mass, um, which is proportional to the top quark Yukawa and whatever the cutoff scale of the theory is. So you imagine that you've got some cutoff lambda and that that tells you the highest scale which your theory is valid. You run this top loop, you're going to get a correction which is proportional to that cutoff squared. And thus the cutoff of the theory people say must be very low because otherwise the Higgs boson would be extremely heavy. The fact that the Higgs boson is 125 GeV tells us that this cutoff should not be that much heavier than 125 GeV. Now, nobody necessarily knows what this is, uh, what solving the hierarchy problem or if there is a solution to it, but it's a compelling problem that people like to talk about it. But if you believe that there is some cutoff of new, op of, of new physics at a scale which is not too hard, high above the weak scale, then you also expect new operators in the effective theory that expands on the standard model. So you take some operator of standard model fields up to some power suppressed by some uh, scale, uh, some power of the cutoff scale uh, to some power, such as you know, an example of an operator like this is say take uh, a derivative operator of the Higgs field, which is a dimension six operator. And you write down all these operators and you say, look, I don't know what the physics is, but there's new physics, which is stabilizing the Higgs boson. Therefore, I should have new operators. In particular, I expect to have new operators that are correcting the properties of the Higgs boson that are going to be suppressed by this scale lambda. And uh, I can look for those. And uh, even if I don't directly produce new particles, I can look for properties of the Higgs boson or standard model particles or weak bosons and see whether they are consistent with the presence or absence of these new operators. And what people of course have found is that in addition to no direct production of new particles at the, stand, at the uh, at colliders, there are also no signs of operators like this. Now that may just be that there are no particles at the weak scale to be seen, but there's another oper op uh, possibility, which is in some sense, maybe more interesting phenomenologically. Uh, and that is that, <clears throat> that if you write down say an operator like this, an operator like this, where you've got standard model fermions on the outside and some new physics in the middle, this operator is generally bad. It goes like directly one over some power of the, the new physics scale. However, 
if you imagine an operator that looks like this, where you've got standard model particles on the exterior legs and a loop of <clears throat> new particles, this is bad, but it's bad divided by 16 pi squared the typical loop factor that you get whenever you have new particles in a loop. And so the argument that was uh, made is forgetting about supersymmetry. The supersymmetry has this property, but you can argue that potentially just new physics should have this property, that if you can only produce particles in pairs, um, then that will tend to suppress the indirect, direct, the indirect signals of the physics at the cutoff. So if new physics, comes in pairs, <clears throat> that suppresses dangerous operators. And thus makes us safe or safer from those uh, new physics. And so if you want to make sure that, that particles only come in pairs, that means you're basically asserting that there's a Z2 of that new physics. And this parity can be found in many models where it's twice the spin of the particle uh, plus the three times the baron number plus L, uh, which you find is sort of a generalization of R parity. And this is called T parity. And if you have uh, this kind of a parity, then you generally can uh, suppress these sorts of, of new physics. But it also means that the lightest T odd particle, the L top, uh, <clears throat> would be stable and thus gives you a dark matter candidate. And this is sort of one of those interesting ideas, which is that not only is the fact that we have a hierarchy problem there, but necessarily that solutions to the hierarchy problem that are safe typically also have stable particles within them. So if that's coming at it from the direction of just what kinds of dark matter models you might expect, let's come back to this idea of the thermal relic. Uh, I'm going to I can take you through this. That way I can just assign it as homework. I know you went through this in, in great detail this morning. But so if you have a thermal relic, then you are, of course, imagining that you've got some process uh, where dark matter is going into standard model particles through some unknown process. It's characterized by some annihilation cross-section sigma v. And <clears throat> this process happens, as you learned this morning, where n sigma v until n sigma v is equal to h. So if your annihilation rate is higher than the Hubble rate, then it's generally in equilibrium. If your annihilation rate is below the Hubble constant, then it is out of equilibrium. And during radiation domination, we know that the Hubble constant is uh, approximately equal to t squared over m Planck. And so the argument, of course, goes that if you are imagining dark matter is a non-relativistic particle, then once you get to a temperature which is comparable to its mass, the number density begins to fall exponentially. And so you know that this particle is going to go out of equilibrium at, go out, excuse me, go out of equilibrium at, t equal to m. And the reason that it has to be t equal to m is because, well, if you have this e to the minus m over t, maybe it's going to go to, out of equilibrium at you know, m over 20, or m over 30, or m over 50. Um, um, uh, but uh, it's not going to um, go out of equilibrium at an exponentially lower value. It's not going to go out at you know, m divided by a billion, because then the number density would be e to the minus a billion, and there wouldn't be any particles to talk about. So you know that this thing has to go out of, out of equilibrium at, um, at t equal to m. So if we imagine that the number density of the particle, if I just take this n sigma v equal to h is t squared over m Planck, and I just set t equal to m, then I know that the number density at freeze out is just m squared over sigma v times m Planck, which means that the energy density then is m cubed over sigma v over m Planck. 
And I want to take that energy density and redshift it to today. So to redshift it from then to today, I need to, to dilute this energy density. But rather than redshifting it all the way today, let me do redshift it to matter radiation equality. Redshifting this to matter radiation equality, I need to sim simply multiply by the temperature of matter radiation equality divided by the temperature that I started off with cubed. And that gives me T matter radiation equality cubed over M cubed times M cubed over sigma V M Planck. And I know that at matter radiation equality, the energy density of dark matter is equal to the energy density in matter radiation equality. And you thus can solve for this and get T MRE is one over sigma V and Planck. If you then take M Planck, uh, sorry, if you take sigma V to be some perturbative coupling divided by some scale, then you end up with the classic formula that the scale of new physics that's contributing to this annihilation is just alpha times the square root of M Planck times the temperature of matter radiation equality. And since the temperature of matter radiation equality is around EV, uh, this ends up with the classic WIMP miracle, which is that lambda should be around the weak scale. Um, I went through this very, very quickly because uh, I, I knew you already went through it this morning. But the reason that I wanted to go through this is, is that it, it shows that this doesn't have to be, even though to get the, the right answer, to get the, the really accurate answer that you want to use to calculate things and find what the rates and everything like this are, you of course need to do this thing carefully. But if you want to understand the parametrics of things, it's really simply asking the question, if I go out of equilibrium around my mass through a process which is two to two, then you follow your nose, ask what the energy density would be in matter radiation equality, and you find this relationship. Um, this then gives you what people like to refer to as the WIMP miracle. I just went through an argument that we expect new particles at the weak scale to solve the hierarchy problem. On the other hand, you go through the thermal freeze out and you find that the natural scale of those particles would be around the weak scale as well. These two things are pointing in the same, uh, uh, to the same scale. Um, and thus you get very excited that this could possibly be a, a dark matter candidate. So how do you find um, a weakly interacting massive particle? And this sort of forms the basis for all of, again, uh, when you talk about WIMPs, what you really nowadays are talking about is simply any thermal relic. It doesn't have to have anything necessarily to do with the weak scale. Uh, but there's sort of a PR plot that people like to show, and I'm going to show because it's the standard PR plot, that if you imagine that you have a process, a two to two process, whereby dark matter can come in and the standard model particles can come out, and who knows what that process precisely is. Well, this, these two directions were the directions that kept this particle in equilibrium in the early universe, dark matter turning into standard model, standard model turning into dark. And so you can start asking questions about how to, to look for this. And so one thing that you can do is run the, slide, uh, the plot this way. And you can say, well, if dark matter can make standard model matter, then standard model matter can make dark matter. And you can go to colliders and you can try to take standard model particles and smash them into each other and produce dark matter. That's one way. You can rotate this plot and think about it going with time going along this axis. And in this case, a dark matter particle comes in against a standard model particle and they collide. Uh, and that's direct detection. So dark matter particle will deposit some energy into the standard model. And you can look for a nucleus or an electron recoiling as dark matter flies into your detector and deposits energy. Or you can continue to run the time this way. So even though dark matter is no longer in equilibrium, a dark matter can annihilate into standard model particles. And you can look for those signals of dark matter today. And that is indirect detection, indirect detection. Um, this is, this diagram is, I would say, half 
true and half uh, PR. Um, the reason is that uh, in general, for most models that you think of, although not necessarily true, and in particular, there are very important exceptions these days that where this is true, the direct detection signals are not exactly the same as the diagrams that gave you freeze out. So for instance, if you annihilate into W bosons, well, you don't have, uh, except for off shell, you don't have any W bosons in ordinary matter. And so if all your interaction was, was annihilating to W bosons, then that doesn't give you necessarily a direct uh, coupling to standard model particles. Um, indirect detection signals are robust, but there's many different options. Uh, are you gonna be annihilating to protons, electrons, photons, neutrinos? Uh, it's not totally clear what you should be looking for. Um, uh, and in colliders, well, you only get a few things to collide against each other, electrons and then uh, uh, quarks. Uh, so how do you know if the uh, freeze out diagram doesn't talk to those that this is going to be something which is actually going to let you produce it? On the other hand, it is kind of schematically accurate. And in some cases, it's more than that. Uh, so this is a good uh, way to uh, keep uh, uh, track of things. Now, something that I'm sure was discussed uh, in depth this morning, um, although I was asleep then, uh, is that you can expand out your um, annihilation cross-section uh, into a series of powers um, where the leading order piece, your annihilation piece, is at relativistic speeds or, or semi-relativistic speeds, um, has a constant piece, which is the S wave piece, then the next piece, the uh, piece which is suppressed by V squared, which is the P wave piece and so on. And what's also important to keep in mind is that while the, at where V is comparable to C, uh, the second piece here, the P wave piece and the higher order terms can be important. These days where dark matter is um, non-relativistic, only the S wave piece is going to be uh, contributing. So, let me switch then and talk about sort of a canonical wimp. And I wanna talk about this because it gives you sort of a lot of the intuition of what you wanna think about. And just going through this process is sort of how you would kind of go through almost any model of dark matter that you'd wanna think about. So a canonical wimp to me is uh, a fermion that looks like the Higgs boson. So uh, this is a Dirac fermion with a, a hypercharge plus or minus one half and uh, double it under SU2. So again, when I said, what is it you're talking about? If I said this, you could think of this as multiple things. You could call this a fourth generation Dirac neutrino. You could call this a Higgs Zeno or you could just call this a doublet with hypercharge plus or minus one half. All those models would have the same basic phenomenology and have the same effective field theory, um, but would have different names and come out of different model contexts. But if you give this particle, if you just imagine a particle with this uh, set of quantum numbers, uh, even if it has no interactions to the standard model, it annihilates immediately and dominantly into gauge bosons, and in particular into um, uh, w bosons, and it has an S wave annihilation cross section, which is set by the weak scale, um, and well, is set by the the particle mass scale, so here this T w is the tangent of the weak mixing angle, so T w squared T w to the fourth. G is the weak coupling constant and then the dark matter mass here. So this is uh, how you, um, you proceed. You figure out your annihilation cross-section and this is your annihilation cross-section. And what we learned this morning was that the annihilation cross-section gives you a complete prediction on what the number density of this particle should be or the energy density of this particle should be today. And for this, then you can directly tie this annihilation cross-section into the amount of this stuff around today. And you find that the uh, relic density is approximately 
the correct relic density for a dark matter particle mass, which is uh, around a TeV. So take a chi, give it a mass of a TeV, and you'll get the relic abundance. And it's very important because the relic abundance is the observation that we have. It's the one thing that allows us to normalize the parameters in the model. In this case, there's only one parameter in the model, namely the mass of the particle. So you match that to observations, and it's completely um, uh, fixed. What's also noting, important to note is that um, when people talk about the WIMP miracle uh, and you know, weak scale particles, uh, it's pretty clear here that we're not really talking about, this is a weakly interacting particle. It's got, it doesn't have strong interactions, right? This is, not, this is coupling to the standard model through G, uh, which is not a particularly strong coupling. Uh, and yet the mass scale that's predicted here is actually uh, above a TeV. Uh, and it's an important point that if you really, you know, people like talk about the, the wind miracle, but the wind miracle doesn't really point to the weak scale. It doesn't point to 100 GeV. It really is pointing much more to a TeV scale, uh, for better or for worse. So, um, so okay, so let's, let's then go through. If we said that we've got this PR plot that tells us how to look for this, Let's think about what this uh, what this can be. Um, it's very hard to look for a TeV weakly interacting particle if you have no other interactions at a collider. Uh, and for the sake of time, because I'm I'm running short on it, uh, the the thing that you want to look at is is direct detection. And tomorrow I'll have actual plots of direct detection you know results and and the different experiments. Uh, there are many different types of direct detection you'll hear about. Spin independent, which is a terrible name because it's not, it's really coherent scattering. Spin dependent, um, which is a pretty good name where you're coupling to the spin of nuclei. But the most common thing that people like to talk about is um, uh, for, for nuclear scattering is what's called spin independent scattering. And what that really means is that you have a cross section which is coherently scattering off of the entire nucleus. So when you hear spin independent, what you should really think of is coherent nuclear scattering. So that is that the scattering cross-section of dark matter off of a nucleus is proportional to something like the atomic number squared or the charge squared of the nucleus. So bigger nuclei get an enhancement uh, from the <clears throat> from the uh, fact that the nucleus has many, many protons and neutrons in it. So fundamentally, what you want to do is you want to calculate the uh, differential scattering rate. Uh, and there's a very simple formula that people will write down, um, although it's, it's something that, that you end up going back and rederiving yourself over and over again, because you can't believe that this is, can possibly be the right formula. Uh, but it is. Let me write it down. So let's suppose you've got some target, some detector, and you want to look for dark matter. Well, your probability of getting a scattering is going to be proportional to just the number of atoms that you have in your experiment. And the more atoms you have, the higher rate you're going to get. It's proportional to the number density of dark matter, the amount of dark matter that is around your experiment. This here is the cross section per nucleon. So in order to compare different experiments, you often like to, uh, because one experiment's going to have xenon, another one's going to have germanium, another one's going to have silicon, uh, you want to normalize them all to the cross section off of a single proton or a single nucleon, and then scale that up to the different experiments. You scale that up to the different experiments by multiplying by this coherence factor here, where you are saying I've got Z protons that, and I couple to protons with an overall scale of FP. I couple the neutrons with a coupling Fn. Usually those are going to be one or zero or you know, some order one number. So this here is the coherence enhancement I just talked about. But the overall momentum scale of a scattering is actually comparable to the size of the nucleus. So very low momentum transfer scatterings will see the coherent nucleus entirely. High momentum transfer 
scatterings will not. And so you have this form factor here to account for the loss of the coherence, which is just the Fourier trans, basically is just the Fourier transform of the uh, uh, nuclear charge density. And lastly, you have this velocity integral here, which goes either by the, called it eta of V min or G of V min are the two names that people will use to talk about this. And this is basically that if I've got a detector, I've got a minimum amount of energy that I can see. So I, I can't go down to zero energy. So I can't see zero energy recoils. So I can only see particles that have at least enough energy uh, to uh, uh, get above my threshold, which means I can only see particles that have a given velocity. So I want to integrate over all the velocity particles in the, in the halo that have velocities that are at least that large. And so that is this integral. So you integrate from V min where the V min is whatever the minimum velocity I need to show up in my experiment is. And I integrate it up to infinity and F of V is just the distribution of speeds. This is the speed distribution, not the velocity distribution. This is not the 3D velocity distribution, but the speed distribution of particles in the halo. Um, let me emphasize uh, and I will give uh, references for this, that there are a lot of errors in important, in classic literature of this integral of f of v over v. And that is because for a long time, tails didn't really matter to people. Uh, and so some approximations were made that didn't take these things into account. Um, so uh, I will give you a good reference, uh, which is uh, Fries, Gondolo, and Savage, uh, which is this ePrint. And you can uh, reliably go there to, to find it. Um, so if you do this and you calculate this, you find that the cross section uh, for this whole thing, for this kind of a WIMP, is 2 times 10 to the minus 39 centimeters squared. And if you go and you look at direct detection plots, you find out that this is dead, 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 way dead, which is a good thing. And I'm running over time, sorry. Uh, this is a good thing that this is dead because this is what models are supposed to do. You start with the basic framework, you calculate the thermal freeze out. It gives you a parameter that can tell you what you're looking for, which is namely the mass of this particle, which is a TeV. I calculate the uh, scattering cross-section and I compare against the experiment. I find this is ruled out. So this is exactly how the system is supposed to work, right? We're supposed to go through this process and get to this, and this is where we've gotten. So um, does that tell us that it's dead? Well, Subinoy is about to tell me that I should stop, so I will tell you how to make this not dead uh, in my, the start of my lecture in the morning, uh, which will then be a jumping off point for all the anomalies that we will be discussing. Great. Uh, so thanks, Neil. Uh, for an amazing introduction to the different models of dark matter. Now we have uh, two, two to three minutes for questions. You guys can put questions, but we have already one question from an undergraduate uh, that uh, from the YouTube, actually, we are live streaming in YouTube, that do you consider the possibility that dark matter does not exist? Um, um, so, uh, no, I don't, although I guess it depends on what you mean by does dark matter not exist? Um, is it possible that dark matter is not well described by a single particle that is um, you know, around the, you know, floating around the Milky Way? Is that a bad description? And the answer to that can clearly be yes. And the axion can be an example of that where you can have uh, the coherent properties of dark matter, the coherent uh, bosonic properties of dark matter can change its nature and give you signals that you would not ordinarily get if you were simply talking about, say, you know, th th where you could simply think of it as a, a series of particles floating around the universe. Um, um, but clearly there is energy density which is contributing to the expansion rate of the, uni of, of the universe, which is not, um, uh, which is not baryonic matter. 
And uh, there is clearly matter which is correlated with, uh, for instance, you know, looking at the observation of the ball cluster. And finally, I would say, you know, I think the biggest thing is that you just look at the cosmic microwave background radiation and you plug in this, you know, cold dark matter paradigm, you calculate what kinds of, of, of power spectra you should get, and you get a, just an amazing agreement with it. So what's clear to me is that, 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 that some energy density has to be out there. And, you know, we've, I'm, I'm sure you heard about this morning, to a large extent, it has to be collisionless and, and have weak or small interactions. Um, so, uh, so I don't take, the possibility there's no dark matter um, to be a strong one, I do take as a real possibility the fact that it might not manifest itself in a sort of like particle form in the way that I'm talking about here. Maybe one quick last question. Uh, uh, one is like, what about graviton, massive graviton dark matter? And another is uh, whether dark matter can be baryonic instead of non baryonic. Yeah, so. Um, uh, so for, for, for massive graviton dark matter, so massive gravitons is an incredibly interesting field, some of it being done by uh, some of my colleagues here. Um, um, but, uh, but it's a very, very detailed question. Uh, and I think, uh, and think about thinking about, um, uh, I, it's an, it's certainly an interesting model, and it's it's one that should be considered. But I, I don't think that there's any sort of ro the the there's currently I would not say any super, super robust evidence for any particular model. Um, in terms of this question um, on um, dark matter being baryonic or uh, uh, versus non baryonic, um, I'm not totally sure that I I I, I know what you mean. Um, does some of the dark matter have to be baryonic or can it all, all be non-baryonic? Certainly all dark matter can be all non-baryonic. All dark matter can actually have absolutely nothing to do with us. It can carry no charges or no interaction standard model whatsoever. And it can just be an accident that it has something to do with it. Of course, in that scenario, we're very, very unlikely to discover it. Um, and there's this classic joke uh, that I won't go into here where you look under the lamppost because that's where you can look. Uh, if dark matter happens to be of something that we can't find, there's not a lot of use in thinking about that dark matter because you're not going to find it. Uh, there is a use in thinking about dark matter that you can find uh, because those the amount of dark matter you can find. That doesn't mean you will find it, but the only kind of dark matter you can find is the dark matter you can find necessarily. Uh, so, so that's why we think about it. Some component of dark matter can of course carry charges uh, from the standard model, uh, could carry lepton number, could carry baryon number. Um, uh, and then how that manifests itself is, um, um, is very model dependent. Great. So uh, rest of the questions, generally we email the speaker and you can answer them tomorrow in the beginning. You can email us, we will we, we, we send them back. The answer. Okay, so now we Great. are running uh, out of time. Yeah, so thanks Neil. Thank you. Uh, 6am at the talk. Yeah, thanks a lot and we'll see you tomorrow. Okay, see you tomorrow. Thanks, everybody. Thank you everybody. Yeah.